Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to preach um, today not because um, it's my job to preach uh, or I get paid to do this. I- I'm standing in front of you because everything I'm going to bring to you, I believe with everything inside of me that Jesus is the Son of God who gave His life, who became ransom for mankind, who would die and face the wrath of God as He carried the sin of mankind. And He stood in the gap and He died so that we could live. I believe with everything inside of me, everything inside this book is true. And so I'm here because I am convinced that what I read is for us and that what we are going to hear today we should see within the life of the church in a regular and an amazing way. It's fun for me because the title of the message is actually uh, Revival Miracles on Your Doorsteps. And I love God's sense of humor because out there on our doorstep, Jamie prays for somebody and they get healed on this day. So a uh, miracle on our doorstep. And uh, you know what? I, uh, I encourage you and I urge you and I want to do it again just in this moment. Please join with me as we pray earnestly for every other church on this island. We want revival across the bride of Christ not just in living hope. We want revival for Christian men and women and then from there across this island. So would you join me, please, just in your quiet times and and at home as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in different congregations and denominations. Okay, have you got a Bible? Can you show me your Bible, please? Your real Bibles? Yes. Oh, they nice. Very good. If you don't have a Bible, then um, you can have one for free. At the front of the church, there's some Bibles here. Is there anybody who would like one who doesn't have one this morning? If you don't have one, you could have this one, and you can take it home, and it's yours. It's a gift from the church. I would like for you to follow where we're going to be. We're going to be in um, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Let me start like this. A few years ago now, a church in a town called Cumbran in Wales was in the midst of a midweek prayer meeting. Not much unlike the prayer meetings we've had here of late in the last couple of months. And um, on this occasion, they were praying, at, if I remember correctly, it was an evening meeting, and nothing particularly special about that prayer meeting. People had come, they prayed in faith, and and they expected to do that and go home again. And as usual, uh, for that congregation, in that prayer meeting, there was a gentleman in a wheelchair. This gentleman had been in that wheelchair for 10 years, unable to walk. And as so many times before, on this evening, in this prayer meeting, he received prayer again. But on this night, the Holy Spirit moved. Suddenly fell on this man. He yelped, jumped up, and started running around the congregation. So majestic, so otherworldly, so terrifying was it that some of the congregants, some of those Christians in the prayer meeting, ran out of the building screaming, terrified at what they'd just seen. He took his wheelchair and held it above his head and ran around the people there with his wheelchair above his head his head. Also immediate and profound was this miracle on that congregation that the news spread like wildfire and people started coming from all over the world because they started having meetings every single night. And at these meetings, people were getting saved, people were getting healed, people were getting restored. The most amazing things were happening in this town called Qumran in this church. And as people started coming from all over the world, five pastors went from the Isle of Man and I was one of them. And we had the opportunity to meet with the senior leadership at that time to just hear what was happening. And then we had to form part of the queue that waited for two hours before the door opened. A queue that went outside the building around the block. Because if you didn't queue, you didn't get into the hall. One miracle and this grace outpouring of the Spirit of God was on that place for months. It was absolutely phenomenal. And I believe, you know, it's significant. The reason I start with this is because this wasn't in biblical times. This wasn't in the first century, the Middle Ages, the 17th century, or the beginning of this century. This was less than seven years ago, about 250 miles that way. Miracles 
on our doorsteps. One mighty miracle like that might spark a grace outpouring. Who knows that even today, perhaps, as that lady speaks in that church over there, what may come? God, let your spirit move. And so in Acts chapter 2, we read how Peter preaches powerfully an uncompromising message, the book of Acts being one of the most exciting books in the New Testament. And, and, and Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches, and he preaches this. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I love that. Repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this day and this message, this sermon Peter preaches will forever become known to us in Christendom as the day of Pentecost. Because the Spirit of God falls on that day and as you know, 3,000 people come into the church in one go. And I, and I have to smile at that because I'm looking at your lovely faces and I'm thinking, what will we do if 3,000 come? <laughs> okay, we will have a little problem, you know? 3,000 people in one day. And then it goes on and it says, actually, God added to their number daily. So 3,000 wasn't the, the end result. No, from that moment forward, God in that season added to their number daily. And then chapter 3 starts of the book of Acts. And it starts with a bang. And we read this in verse 1 of Acts chapter 3. It says this. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour. It's late afternoon, heading into evening, and Peter and John are on their way to church. And in Peter and John's day, it was always spoken about going up to the temple. It, it, was, it was out of a cultural reverential respect. We, we are going to go up to the temple. Their idea, their paradigm, how they saw church wasn't just that it's another thing on the tick list to do. No, to go to temple, to go to be with the people of God was significant and important and a priority for them. Peter and John walking up. And Peter and John belong to Jesus Christ, you know. They're going to this temple because they're about to go and worship. They see it as a privilege and a joy. It's non-negotiable. And I'm sure on the way there, they may have talked. At least on occasion, they would have talked about what was happening in the life of the church. Peter and John walking side by side on the way to church. And John saying to Peter, Peter, can you believe so-and-so just came into our family? And John's like, oh, I, I remember them, you know, but it's not half as much of a miracle as those people over there. That God brought in. And I love that idea because in my mind's eye, I can see the likes of Rulf and I walking from the south. You know, Rulf from Colby and I'm coming from Port Erin. And we're walking down on the way to church. We're like, Rulf, can you believe it? God added yet another family to our church. He's like, I know God is good. And then you're looking at me, you go like, Mr. So, oh, was last night's prayer meeting not sweet? Was it not so rich? Wasn't the presence of God in our midst? Were, we, were you also crying when, when, when that couple just spontaneously realized that Jesus loves them and surrendered their life to Him? I can see it. And so Peter and John are having this conversation, and, and surely Peter would remind himself frequently of what Jesus said on occasion when He said to him, Man, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against what I am going to build. I'm paraphrasing there a little bit, but you know the passage. Peter looks at John. May this be what happened today as we meet here at church. And they're literally experiencing in this moment in the book of Acts what we have been praying for since the out outset of this series. They are they're in revival they, they are seeing something magnificent. They are seeing what our hearts yearn for. Isn't that true? They are in a time whereby it's not them going out to try and convince people to come and join the church. No, it's literally people just coming into as God adds to their number daily. And I wonder whether you can see it in your mind's eye, whether you've got the faith for it, that when you come to the front doors of the building there, there's just people you don't know where they're from or how they got there. But you know they're going to sit on your seat today. <laughs> and you want that. 
as people are added to the number. And now at this moment, Peter and John have not yet noticed a man who was about to engage with the both of them, a crippled man. The Bible tells us had been crippled since birth. In verse 2, we read this. It says, And a man lame from birth was being carried, who they lay daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. And it's, it's a nice sentiment, isn't it, to think that people would love him enough to carry him every single day to go and put him there at church, which is a good spot because people are going to go in and out of that, there, that place too, you know, and he can make a living. by It's, it's great friends, really, isn't it? Well, actually, it's not quite as selfless as it may seem in the first instance. Because in Judaism, almsgiving was seen as a meritorious act. What this means, or meritorious act, this means that if, if I give something to somebody who can't work, I'm going to earn a little bit of divine favor. So it's great that you're sitting there at the gate beautiful. It's great that you're begging because I may have just have screamed at the wife. I may have just have kicked the children. But if I give you a couple of alms as I come into the church, you know, there's a little bit of merit, a little bit of favor as I come before the Lord. So it wasn't quite as amazing as it may appear at first. And for the poor crippled man, this must have been bittersweet. Because in Judaism, Bible scholars tell us that he probably would not have been allowed as a crippled man to go into the temple. And so he's sitting here and he's the cause for others receiving a little bit of favor from the Lord to go into a place where he can never go. That's tough, isn't it? Day after day, after day, after day. And so in verse 3 we see this. It says, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, as he sees the t these two men, he asks to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. Look at us. And this is my first point if you're making notes today. Get their attention. If you're writing this down, Get their attention. I find it so fascinating that verse 3 says this. Seeing them, he calls out to them. So he's already looking at them. And then Peter says, look at us. In other words, there's more that's going to happen here in this moment than what is the norm. See, Peter and John were not just another set of guys on their way to church. These men had been with Jesus for three years. They had seen the miracles of Jesus. They had seen the dead being raised. They had seen those with leprosy healed. They had seen wonders where food was multiplied and people were fed. They had been exposed to the most incredible miracles that they could only dream of. And then they had seen one of their closest friends, a guy called Judas, betray Jesus. And they saw how Jesus was brought before the authorities of that day, how Jesus was unfairly tried, how he was brutally whipped, how he was crucified. And they would have known that from the cross, Jesus cried out saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And then three days later, they saw Christ resurrected. They saw Jesus so these weren't normal guys just on their way to a religious service. There was more behind them coming into the fellowship of believers. And the Gospel of John, I love it, the Gospel of John, the fourth of our Gospels, it says this, now there were so many things that Jesus did. You've got to catch this. It says that were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The Holy Spirit revealed to us that which we need to know. But there is much more to know, let me tell you. And they say that there was so much that Jesus did that actually there wouldn't be enough books to write in all the miracles and all the healings and all the wonderful. And John and Peter would have been exposed to much of that. You know, earlier this week I sent out a little text to I think many of you, most of you. And uh, I sent it via WhatsApp. And uh, I think we've got it, um, the next slide, if you put the next slide on, you may remember. 
And I, I, I send this out and I ask below this verse, listen, if you've got a prayer request, just come back to me with a prayer request. And for the rest of the morning, my phone just went ding, 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 ding. And I was so pleasantly surprised at how many of you came back to me asking, could you please pray for this? Could you please stand in the gap for that? Could you please intercede for the following? I loved it. And I was more encouraged by the fact that, that some of you actually asked, just give me or stand in the gap with me that God would give me an opportunity to share the gospel. Please pray with me that God will make it so that I can share Jesus with others. I was so encouraged by that. I love that. Opportunities to further the kingdom through the gospel. That in your heart is that thing. Like, I, I want to be used as an ambassador for the kingdom. I want to be like Jamie, who if somebody's going to walk by, they're not going to get beyond me without me engaging with them, and I'm going to get them. And if they allow me, I'm going to pray for them. And if they stand still long enough, they're going to get healed. I love that. And you know, just now, I, I think that the morning is taking us there a little bit, that it's not really one uh, of those days that I stand at the front and you just sit down and listen. I actually think today is a day where you engage with me. And so, you know what? I want for us to be a people who would get the attention of those around us. Who would actually, although they already see us, although they're already sharing life with us, we say, no, stop, I've got something for you to hear. Look at me. Do you get this? And so when I give you the microphone in a moment, I want you to pray for us as a church to just say, God, will you help us not to miss the opportunities that you put in front of us every day? Would you stand with us? James just looks like he wants to pray. Father God, I want to, <clears throat> I want to thank you first for, for, for this church and for the, um, the, the spirit you, you, you let loose in this place. Um, I just want to pray for further um, and cast the spirit for, for the whole earth, if you like, um, and especially Ports Mary right now, and that we can reach out and reach those people around us. Uh, where they are, whether there is any hardship physically, mentally, or spiritually, Lord, that we can help you reach them and, and bring them into churches all across this land, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jesse. The Lorna also wants to pray. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Father God, I just thank you that you do give us opportunities, and um, we repent of the times that we've not taken them, Father, that we shied away. And I just pray that you give us courage and boldness. And when we see somebody around us, we don't wait for someone else to pick up the basin and towel, but we do it for you. Thank you. Um, oh. Most of you know that Katie is not the first child I've lost. Um, and I just need to say that the devil had his hand in Natasha and I've had a demon on my back whispering, well, not even whispering, shouting awful, awful things in my ears for years and years and years. I now believe that Katie was born for this purpose and for this time. Um, she is my miracle. I feel completely healed. My mind is at peace. I'm full of joy. I'm full of hope. And there's no explanation other than it is from God. I'm walking around with a smile on my face. I can't stop reaching out to people. So I need to reintroduce myself to you all. Hi, I'm Becky Taylor. It's wonderful to meet you. So Becky, Becky in this moment can and have e every reason in the world to go and sit in a dark corner somewhere, but choosing not to let the opportunities pass her by. And so for us, as you pray here in our midst, that we will be like Peter and John that says, look, put your attention on us. It goes on, you know, it says in verse 5, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. This is my second point of your making notes. Know your authority. Know your authority. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Peter and John understand in this moment that there's an authority behind them. That is, that is, it's not them. It's not anything to do with them. It's, it's He who is in them and through them and behind them. And they come in that authority. And Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And in the name of Jesus Christ here means, I am acting as His representative. I speak for Him. I am an ambassador. So when I pray now for somebody to get healed, when we lay our hands on your shoulder to pray for your shoulder, is it feeling any better? Okay, so when we prayed now for you, it wasn't Rousseau and Rian. It was in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. It's His authority, not ours. It's the Spirit of God within you, not you. And you, you probably sometimes make the mistakes that I make whereby we're faced with a situation like that. And in that moment, your faith moves off of Jesus and onto you. And it's like, well, I, I don't think I should pray because I don't think anything will happen. And your faith now is in your authority and in you. Where actually it should be in Christ Jesus and His kingdom. And the reminder that it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. That's the authority in which you stand when you pray. Now let me say this. God may not heal immediately in the moment when you pray. I can't guarantee that He will always answer immediately the way you ask Him. But I can guarantee that if you ask Him, nothing will happen. I can guarantee that if we don't pray, nothing will happen. If we pray, something may happen. If we don't pray, nothing will happen. That's the guarantee. In the name of of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth. And I felt in my heart, you know, as I was preparing this message, just to say, God, would you forgive us as a church and as your people? Because how many times people remain ill and they remain broken and they remain lonely and they remain depressed and hopeless and helpless because the bride of Christ chooses to put arms in the hands of those who reaches out rather than standing and saying, I don't have gold, I don't have silver, but in the name of Jesus Christ, I will pray. And believe that God would do something. And what we do is we exchange almsgiving for the supernatural authority. Now listen to me carefully. We must always give alms. We must always be the hands and feet of Jesus and look after people physically and emotionally as well. But never, never in exchange for looking after them spiritually. You guys hearing this? Peter and John could have easily have just have put a couple of arms in that man's hand, and it would have been a good thing like everybody else was doing. But they did more. They did more. We have swapped our authority and majesty as Jesus Christ through us for good works in many places. And we must give arms, but we must give arms as we give the supernatural as well. You know, in Mark chapter 16, Verse 17 to 18, it says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. Let me just stop. Who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in this church? Okay, I see many hands. Now let me just read this passage slightly different from the way that you know it. It says this, In my name, you who raised your hands will cast out demons. You who raised your hands who believe in Jesus will speak in new tongues. You will pick up serpents and in your hands, and if you drink deadly poison, it will not hurt you. Because you're a believer, right? It says those who believe. You raised your hand, I saw it. You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You. Because of Christ Jesus behind you and the Spirit of God in you. That's why. And you know what? I wanted for us to have a big old prayer session at the end of this message, but kind of the Holy Spirit had a different vibe going this morning. So we kind of already did that. So I'm preaching back into history because I want to get to where we were. Okay? Come again tonight. Things will be much more calm, I'm sure, in Castletown. Jesus Christ, by His Holy Spirit, is stirring some of us even now. I have faith for this. In this moment... To move beyond good works. You have been great at good works. You have been great at giving alms. Don't stop that. But I believe the Holy Spirit wants to stir some of you here today to move beyond that place into a place where you walk in His authority. 
I wanted for us to pray one more time, but I'm running out of time. I'll quickly skip a couple of things here. Number three, just so you get all the points. Number three, step out in faith. Step out in faith. In verse 7, we read the following, And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. Now, Peter had already prayed in the name of Christ Jesus for this man. He prayed and he said, be healed. He prayed that, but now he had to put faith into action. The guy wasn't healed just yet, note this, until Peter took him by the hand and pulled him up. He physically did something. I have faith, I prayed, I'm physically going to do something right now. And think about it right now in this place. Who do you know in your family who's sick? Who, who, who do you know that's, that's depressed? Who do you know that's hopeless in their, in their way of thinking, their, their outlook on life? Who is deaf? Who, who is blind? To whom have we been given words of comfort, but we've never said, let me lay hands on and stand in the authority of Jesus Christ and let's see if God will move. Church, will you do that? Could we do that? And let Jesus do what only He can do. And I want to ask in this moment, well, you know, for us, as the opportunities present itself for they will this week, because we've asked for them, for you to have courage to say, I'm going to do it. I'm, going to, I'm just going to go for it and pray in the name of Jesus. That man in Qumran, his testimony was this. When they prayed for me, those who prayed were most surprised when he actually got up out of his pushchair of his wheelchair. You know, And so you may not feel the most faithful in the moment when you do it, but step out in faith. Christ Jesus is behind you. And watch this, I'll finish with this. We're out of time. In verse 8 it says, And leaping up he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Man, I love this. You know why I love this? If my legs have not been working my entire life, if I was born crippled, if this is the first moment that I ever get up ever, I think I'd want to go run through the streets of Jerusalem. I think I want to feel the pleasure of what it feels like to have the wind through my hair, you know, and like going for gold and getting out of breath and feeling the stitch of just running on legs that never worked properly. Perhaps running to my family. Perhaps running to my friends. Perhaps running to, to show the people who, who didn't give me arms, who never extended a friendly or a kind hand, to show them, I don't need you anymore. Look, my legs are working. But you know what he does? He goes to church. <laughs> That's the first thing he does. He's just been healed, a mighty miracle. And he chooses, I'm going to go into church. It says here, entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. God. Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And I feel in my heart it's a time for the church of Christ Jesus, this congregation and further afield, to usher in again through faith a season of amazement and wonder onto this island. Where people would say, we don't know what those guys are believing. We don't see what they see. But in their midst, things happen that shouldn't happen. Miracles take place when those people meet. People get healed when those guys serve coffee at the front of the church. Something of God is in their midst. And I feel in my heart God is eager for us to rise up in the faith and to be the cause in Jesus Christ's name to see others stand in amazement saying, God, there must be a God. And I feel in my heart that God is calling specifically some of you today to stand up and say, people, give me your attention. I come in an authority of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I am ready to step out in faith. It won't be all of you, but there may be some here today that God goes, yes, the time for you is now. It's time for you to start seeing miracles in your life and the life of your church as you rise up. In faith.